Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on the introductory linear algebra based on my book, Retrolinear. The subject of this lecture is diagonalizability of matrices and linear operators. To follow this lecture, you need to know certain things. And all of these have been topics of previous videos. You need to know what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, not just for matrices, but also for linear operators. A linear operator is a linear transformation from a vector space to itself. Um, you also need to find how to know how to find the matrix of a linear operator, or more generally, the matrix of a linear transformation um, with respect to an ordered basis. So if someone gives you a basis and a linear transformation, how do you find a matrix that does the job of that linear transformation for you? Again, the subject of um, the earlier videos. You also have to know about change of basis matrices, the matrices that allow you to change coordinates of vectors from one coordinate system to another, from one, one basis uh, to another. Okay, um, so let's start with a thought experiment. So let's say you have a finite dimensional vector space and um, you have a linear operator. Again, what that means is that you have a linear transformation uh, from a vector space to itself. So the domain and the codomain are both V for this linear operator T. And let's say that by, by hook or crook, you find yourself a basis for this vector space, uh, basis B, the name of B is the main of the basis and the elements are V1 through Vn. And this is actually an ordered basis. The order matters as a, in addition to what the elements of these spaces are. So you, you have this basis and um, happens that this V1 through Vn are eigenvectors of T. So, um, so if that happens, my question is that, what's the matrix of T with respect to this basis? Now, first of all, let me remind you what eigenvectors are. So uh, to say that V1 through Vn are eigenvectors, that means that when you apply T to them, you get a multiple of themselves. So T of V1, when you plug in V1 into T, into this function, you get just the scalar lambda one times V1. Lambda one is a scalar. Just you just get a multi, you just um, get V1 gets scaled. Um, lambda one is the scalar that scales V1 and T of V1 is lambda one V1. And T of V2 is lambda one, lambda two V2 all the way till T of Vn is lambda N Vn. Um, some of these lambdas might be the same. I, I don't really care, but, but I have a basis. That means a spanning set that's linearly independent for the vector space uh, such that all of the elements are eigenvectors. Okay, so what? So in, in such a case, then what is the matrix of T with respect to B? So uh, this notation here says, find me the matrix that does the job of this linear operator T for me and use the basis B for both the domain and the codomain. If we were using different bases, uh, that would not be the subject of this lecture, but if we were, then the notation would be a little bit more cumbersome. We would write with respect to B and S, um, and we would put two subscripts here. But whenever we're using the same basis for the domain and the codomain, we are gonna do that all throughout this lecture. Uh, we just write the matrix of T with respect to B. So what is that? So how do we find the matrix of T with respect to a, a, a basis? What you do is you start with the first element of the basis element, you send it over, but then you write the coordinates of that with respect to the basis B again, and that will be your first column. And, and when we have eigenvectors, our job is particularly easy because T of V1, we know what it is. It's just lambda 1 V1. But what are we do, going to do with this lambda 1 V1? We're going to write it in terms of B. So we want to find the coordinates of lambda 1 V1 with respect to B. But V1 is an element of B. And so what is the coordinates of lambda 1 V1 with respect to B? That means how many V1s, how many V2s, how many V3s, how many Vn's you need so that that linear combination gives you lambda 1 V1. Well, because V1 is already there, all you need is lambda one of that first element and none of the other ones. And so the coordinates of T of V1 plus in terms of lambda one V1, in, the, in terms of B, the coordinates of T of V1 in terms of B will just be one, zero, zero, zero. Um, and um, so let's see, yes. So, so it will be lambda one, zero, 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 because you need lambda one of the first element and none of the other ones to make T of V1. Likewise, when you do T of uh, the same thing with T of V2, T of V2 is 
lambda 2v2. And so the coordinates of t of v2 with respect to b is going to be just the column vector z lambda 2 and all zeros. Because again, to get lambda 2v2 in terms of b, you know, need no v1s, lambda 2v2s, and none of the other ones. So this is what the coordinate you get. And this repeats for each one of those basis elements. And then each one of these is going to be the columns of your the matrix of t with respect to b, the thing we want to find. And therefore, the matrix of T with respect to B will be this diagonal matrix. A diagonal matrix is a matrix that it only has non-zero non entries on the diagonal. Some of the entries on the diagonal may be zero also. It's just that off the diagonal, we are guaranteed to get all zeros. And that's sort of a really nice matrix. We have seen in a previous video uses for that in terms of if you want to, for example, um, uh, find iterations of T high, if you want to keep doing T over and over again, and you want to know what happens in the long run, having the matrix T in this uh, format is helpful. Um, and there are many other uses for having diagonal matrices um, um, as such. Okay. Now, conversely, if you um, someone tells you that they have a basis B and the matrix of T with respect to B is diagonal, then you know that, that they, the converse of this is true also, that that basis that they had, that mystery basis that they didn't tell you about, must have been a basis of eigenvectors because this whole argument can go for backwards. So if the matrix of T with respect to B is this diagonal matrix, let's concentrate on the second column for a second. How, how could it be that the second column is zero lambda two zero 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 zero? Well, that means that when you wrote T of V2 in terms of B, you, those were the, code, the scalars you needed to get T of V2. So T of V2 was zero V1 plus lambda two V2 plus zero V3 and so forth. So T of V2 is lambda two V2. And that means that V2 is an eigenvector. And so um, this is an if and only if. And, and let me now put that together as a theorem. So if V is a finite dimensional vector space, the argument that we just showed, and V is a basis for V, and you have a linear operator, again, that's a linear transformation from a vector space to itself, then what we showed is that the matrix of T with respect to B is a diagonal, is a diagonal matrix, if and only if, B, the basis, consists of eigenvectors of T. Now, this is not a basis that's going to be useful for all linear operators. It's just useful for this particular linear operator. So if a linear operator walks through the door, at that point, when you see that linear operator, after you introduce yourself, say hello, you figure out what the eigenvectors for that linear operator are. And if you can make a basis for your vector space out of those, then you, the matrix of the linear transformation with respect to that basis will be a diagonal uh, matrix. So one question is that, is this always possible? If not, is it sometimes possible? Well, sometimes, yes. We, in fact, in previous videos, uh, you've seen times when, uh, when that's possible. For example, I mean, it might be that the, the linear transformation, for example, is the linear transformation that you get from a diagonal matrix. Well, of course, then if you use the standard basis, then the matrix of that linear transformation with respect to the standard basis will be that original diagonal matrix. So it is sometimes possible, but maybe it's always possible. Um, well, spoiler alert is not always possible. It's sometimes possible. And, um, and, and so let's see. For that reason, I want to give a definition. We want to define, give a name to those linear operators, those linear transformations from a vector space to itself for which we can find a basis of eigenvectors and for which the matrix of the linear transformation with respect to that basis will be diagonal. So V is a vector space of dimension N. Uh, we have a linear operator. T is, and, and let's wait and on, on see what we are gonna call it. Um, but whatever we're gonna call it is we're gonna call that, give it give a name to the situation where we have a basis for V um, um, such that the matrix of T with respect to that um, is diagonal matrix. So what should we call it? So, so what, if you were going to call a vector, a linear operator um, such that you could find a basis if you tried hard enough so that the matrix of the linear transformation with respect to that ordered basis is diagonal, what should we call that linear operator? And this is one of my favorite words in linear algebra. We call that matrix diagonalizable. Um, and it's sort of fun to say that, diagonalizable. So T is diagonalizable if um, there exists a basic B for V, such that the matrix of T with respect to B the mat is a diagonal matrix. Now, diagonalizable is a mouthful. And so some authors uh, try to shorten that and call, um, uh, call such linear operators diagonable, but diagonable isn't a word, uh, isn't even a word. And so I don't like it. So I'm not gonna do that. So I'm gonna keep with diagonalizable and, and enjoy the fact that I get to say diagonalizable often. 
Okay, so whenever we have a definition for linear transformations or linear operators, we have a definition for matrices. Since it's a linear operator, a linear transformation from a vector space to itself, we have a definition also for square matrices. So if A is an N by N matrix, what's the corresponding definition? We say that the matrix is diagonalizable. Basically, if it's the matrix of a diagonalizable linear transformation. But if we take all the jargon out, what does that mean? The matrix is diagonalizable if it's similar to a diagonal matrix, such that so, so that if there exists an invertible matrix P, such that P inverse AP is diagonal. We have discussed in a previous lecture that when you have, um, when you um, start with a linear transformation, and if you use different bases for the uh, linear operator, and if you uh, use different bases for the domain and the codomain, uh, you know, one basis for the domain and codomain once, and another basis for the domain and codomain another time, then you might get two different base matrices. In fact, you will get two different basic matrices, and those two matrices will be similar to each other. And what that means is that there will be some invertible matrix P that happens to be a change of basis matrix, such that P inverse AP uh, for, will be the other matrix. So to say that, uh, so, so this definition, that a matrix is diagonalizable, if you can find a matrix P such that P inverse AP is diagonal, is associated to the previous definition, because this says that A and P inverse AP are both the matrices of the same linear transformation, except one of them is not diagonal, one of them is diagonal. I mean, it could be diagonal and we could use P to be identity. The point is that if you can do this, uh, you have um, um, uh, a, diagonal, a diagonalizable matrix. So another way of saying it is that a diagonalizable matrix is one that's similar to a diagonal matrix. So let me repeat that, I like repeating myself. Let me repeat it one more time, but this time restate it slightly. So if you have a vector space of dimension N, and if you have a linear operator from T to E, uh, V to V, when is it diagonalizable? Well, if and only if you can find a basis of, of V uh, consisting of eigenvectors of T. But, but what does that mean? Well, if the vector space is dimension N, how many eigenvectors do you need? Well, you need N linearly independent ones. There's gonna be plenty of eigenvectors sitting there. So if, if V is an eigenvector, for, for, for a linear transformation, for a linear operator, so is five times V. Because if T of V is lambda V, T of five times V will be five times T of V, five times lambda V or lambda times five V. So um, um, if V is an eigenvector, so it will be five V. So, uh, so all um, scalar multiples of an eigenvector are also eigenvectors. So usually there's tons of them, but that doesn't help you. What you want is a basis of eigenvectors, and therefore what you really need is n linearly independent eigenvectors. So that's really what you want. So can I find n linearly under, uh, uh, independent eigenvectors for this linear operator? Okay, now let's uh, change focus a little bit and think of the matrix P. Um, that matrix P, when we talk, we're talking about uh, uh, matrices, the P inverse AP, and, and that's a helpful thing to think about. So this is a diagram that you've seen in previous videos. Um, so uh, T is a function from V to V, a linear operator, and, uh, um, and I can find its matrix with respect to some basis S. Um, and I, if I find that, I find the matrix A. Uh, that's the matrix of uh, T with respect to this basis S. But I can also um, uh, pick a different basis B and, and find the matrix of T with that, that different basis. And I get a matrix, uh, another matrix, maybe D. Um, and so when we talked about A being diagonalizable is if I can find a matrix B such that a, a basis B such that the matrix D is diagonal, or if T is a linear transformation, this might be the standard basis. S might be the standard basis with respect to standard basis. You have some kind of a matrix, but if you can find this fancy basis of eigenvectors and with respect to that D is diagonal, then T will be diagonalizable. So we have these two pictures. And how do they, uh, the two sides, the top and bottom connect? They connect with the identity map. The identity map is the map that doesn't do anything, that sends V to V. So if, if you, here I'm gonna send V to V and um, I'm gonna send V to V there. And, and the way to think about this diagram is that if you're on the upper left V corner, upper left V, you might apply T and go across over there. Or you might not like that and you might apply identity, which is doing nothing, and then apply T and then do nothing. And those two routes 
give you the same thing. In, in algebra, we say that the two, uh, that the diagram commutes. So going across the top is the same as going across, um, across the bottom. And, and the way we write that is that T, that top one, is the same as the composition of identity with T with identity. Now this last identity is actually that first identity because when we write function composition, the thing we write on the, on, on, on the right side at the end is the first thing we apply because when we write F of, when we, we compose F and G, F of G of X, G applies to X first. So this identity is that first identity, then we apply T that identity because identity doesn't do anything, we get T. But we can also translate these to the matrices of these linear transformations. Identity as well as those Ts are linear transformations and they all have matrices. And matrices of linear transformations, when you compo compose linear transformations, their matrices multiply. That was the subject of a uh, previous lecture as well. So uh, what is the matrix of the identity uh, from V to V when we use the basis B for the domain and basis S for the codomain? Well, that, this is the way we write it, the matrix of identity with respect to B, B and S, even though we write S comma B, we read, read it as B and S, and, and that's gonna be our P. This is the change of basis matrix, the change of basis matrix from B to S. And all it is, is writing elements of B in terms of um, S, writing the coordinate vector in terms of S, and those coordinate vectors are the columns of this matrix. What about the other side? The other side, is going to be the inverse of that, that P. Or if you want to think about it, that's the change of basis matrix from S to B. That's taking elements of S and writing them, writing their coordinates in terms of the basis B and making those the columns of your matrix that gives you P inverse. And the point is that because going across the top, that linear transformation T is the same as if you go all the way around, then that means that the, if, I, if I multiply these three matrices, I should get D. So, um, it, so, so that means that the matrix of T with respect to B, that's the matrix going across the top, is the same as um, first we do the, the, the one on the, on the extreme right, the change of matrix matrix from B to S, then the matrix of T with respect to S, and then the matrix, uh, the change of basis matrix from S to B. When you multiply these three matrices, you get that. Or if um, uh, you can, uh, in, if V is Rn, for example, um, um, or, or your, then, then you can think about this in a, in a little bit uh, uh, simplified ver version. Um, and let's say V is Rn and S, the bottom one is the standard basis. Then, and B is the basis of eigenvectors of T. So let's assume that we have in this particular situation where S is the standard basis and B is that fancy uh, basis of eigenvectors that we like. Then, um, and, and then if B is the basis of eigenvectors, then D will be diagonal and then, what will be there's this relationship? The relationship will be that, uh, well, what will be P? P will be the change of basis matrix from B to S, but all that is is the matrix of eigenvectors because to find the change of basis matrix from B to S, you have to take elements of B and write them in terms of the standard basis. But the elements of B are elements of Rn and S is the standard basis. So you already have written them in terms of the standard basis. So there's no more step. So you take elements of P and just make them columns of P. So columns of P are the eigenvectors of T in this particular situ situation. So if you have the standard basis and then you have a basis of eigenvectors, P is just the matrix of eigenvectors of T. And then what that fancy relation on top says is that the diagonal matrix D is P inverse AP. So this is, um, so A and D are similar. So if you, if you start with the matrix A, and if you find this basis of eigenvectors, then you just make yourself a matrix made up of those eigenvectors. What do I mean by that? You just write those eigenvectors as column vectors of that matrix and call that P, and then that will be automatically invertible, um, P inverse A, and you get P inverse AP, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then P inverse AP will be diagonal. Okay. Uh, so, so, so just remember that, that P inverse AP uh, will be diagonal if you're you have a basis of eigenvectors, and if you make P just made up of those eigenvectors. Okay, now, so that was from, we combined the linear transform, the, the, the linear operator and, and matrix point of view, just uh, distilling that and, and just saying what we just, I just said, repeating again, in terms of matrices, if you start with an N by N matrix, matrix, 
And if you have a basis of uh, n uh, linearly independent eigenvectors that make a basis of Rn for eigenvectors of A, um, and you assume that A uh, VI is lambda IVI, well, that's the, the, because these are eigenvectors that it's going to be true for some scalars lambda. Then you make this matrix P. Again, the columns are just those eigenvectors. Those eigenvectors are column vectors in Rn. Um, then um, P inverse AP will be the diagonal. And the diagonal matrix, the, 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 the elements in the diagonal, the entries in the diagonal will exactly be the eigenvalues. In what order? In the order of uh, the basis. So uh, the, 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 the first diagonal element will be the eigenvalue associated with the first eigenvector and so forth. And this is true for any field. If this is your second time through linear algebra and you're not just, this doesn't have to be Rn, um, it could be, uh, the, the scalars could be from any field. A could have entries in any field and you could have a basis in Fn, which is a vector space just like Rn is of eigenvectors of A, the same thing would work. Okay, now let's look at a couple of examples. So um, here's a matrix A. By the way, we'll, there will be more examples and bigger examples in a, in, a, in a later video on eigenspaces. But here we will just proof of concept. I'm gonna show you uh, two, um, um, two examples. We will continue those examples in the next video. So A is this uh, two by two matrix, minus one, minus four is the first column, one, three is the second column. Looks like a decent enough matrix. Um, is A diagonalizable? So that's a question that we can ask and we can keep saying that word. Is it diagonalizable? So to do that, we have to find out if, can, if I can find enough eigenvectors of A that are linearly independent. Now this is two by two. So if I think of it as a linear operator, it goes from R2 to R2. So I need two linearly independent eigenvectors. So, for, so first I find the eigenvalues. And to do that, I first find the characteristic polynomial. So I find lambda I2 minus A and, um, and, and that's just going to be, um, you take lambda times the identity matrix and then subtract your matrix A, and you will get uh, this matrix lambda plus one, four, uh, minus one, lambda minus three. And then you find the determinant of that. The determinant of that is the characteristic polynomial. And um, uh, in this case, it's, it's just, it's two by two. So if you multiply it out, as long as I've not made a mistake, it's going to be lambda minus one quantity squared. This is the characteristic polynomial. Why we find the characteristic polynomial is that, is that the roots of it um, are the eigenvalues for A. A root is, when, is, is a number that makes it zero. A number that makes it zero makes that determinant zero. So why do we want determinant zero? Because we want lambda I2 minus A2 not be invertible. Why do we want it not to be invertible? We don't want it to be invertible so that lambda I2 minus A times x equals zero, which is a system of homogeneous linear equations to have a non-trivial solution. Why do we want that to have a non-trivial solution? Because that non-trivial solution is an eigenvector. So uh, to, to have an eigenvector for lambda, you've got to have, you pick a lambda that's a root of the characteristic polynomial. And so in this case, lambda equals one is the only eigenvalue. And then we, 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 um, uh, we, we can find the eigenvectors and the eigenvectors are the null space of um, I2 minus A. Well, lambda I2 minus A, but lambda here is one. So if you plug in one instead of lambda, you get I2 minus A. And I2 minus A is this matrix. And, um, uh, and you can now find its um, uh, null space. How do you find its null space? You, um, which is also called the kernel. Uh, you want to find X1, X2, points X1, X2, such that uh, this product is zero. That's the same as solving a system of equations. And in fact, there's not two equations to unknowns. There's really one equation to unknowns because these two are uh, linearly dependent. The rows are linearly dependent. And, and that's not a surprise because we made that determinant equals zero. This the matrix is not invertible. So it does not have linearly independent rows. And so the only equation we have to worry about is 2x1 minus x2 is zero. And we get that the eigenvectors of A, well, the null space is all the uh, points of the form A to A. One of those elements in the null space is not an eigenvector. And that's when A is zero because eigenvectors can't be the zero vector, but everything else is an eigenvector. So all the eigenvectors of A are of the form A to A and, and that's it. And from, I mean, there's infinite number of them, but from among them, we can find only one linearly on the independent eigenvector. Um, the, the set of the null space, which is called an eigenspace, which we will talk about later in, a, in the future video in, in more detail, 
is a, a subspace of R2. It's a one-dimensional subspace of R2. So you can, it has a basis of one element. So you have one linearly independent eigenvector. And, and, and that's all you get, but you want a two. And so this means that this matrix A is not diagonalizable. So that um, nice utopia where all matrices would be diagonalizable is not the case there. This matrix is not diagonalizable. All is not lost. In fact, in a future lecture, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, if you are walking down the streets and run into a matrix and you've got a bet, I would bet that the matrix, a square matrix is diagonalizable. The reason is that um, I, the reason is that even if a square matrix that's not diagonalizable, if you perturb the entries a little bit, just change them a little bit, like add a point oh, 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 one to one of them or something. If it's not diagonalizable, then it'll be diagonalizable. Um, and and um, and 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 so in, in some ways um, you have to work hard to find uh, uh, non diagonalizable not diagonalizable matrices. Uh, we'll talk about that later, and and especially in. In, in places where matrices come from the real world, from economics or from chemistry or, or physics, where the entries are really not going to be precise anyway and, and are going to be uh, approximations, then um, um, thinking about di diagonalizable matrices is actually the first place to start and a very important case, um, because as I said, most matrices are diagonalizable. Okay, um, all right. Now, th th this problem uh, does raise a question that maybe the problem was the, was the characteristic polynomial. Um, if the characteristic polynomial is lambda minus one, two may, squared, maybe that's the reason why this was not diagonalizable. So one question is that, is A always not diagonalizable if the characteristic is lambda minus one squared? And the answer is no. Um, and, and the simple example is the identity matrix. The identity matrix also has that characteristic poly polynomial and it's diagonalizable. Um, in fact, it's already a diagonal matrix and I can make other ones, but, but um, the, the, this, this is, uh, um, I mean, if I want a two by two matrix uh, whose uh, both of its uh, eigenvalues are one, um, uh, then I'm, then, then I'm um, uh, uh, stuck with, um, with, uh, with identity matrix. But that's an example that shows that two different matrices can have the same characteristic polynomial. And just from the characteristic poly polynomial, you can't say if it's diagonalizable or not. There are other uh, polynomials associated to matrix that would be uh, subject for an advanced linear algebra class, uh, something called the minimal polynomial, uh, that if you knew that and looked at it, you could tell if a matrix is uh, diagonalizable or not, but you can't tell from the characteristic polynomial alone. So here's another example, uh, minus two, eight, minus 18 is the first column, 313 is the second column. And uh, we want to know is A diagonalizable as well. So again, we find um, um, lambda I2 minus A with the aim of finding the characteristic polynomial. Um, and um, we find the determinant of that matrix. The determinant is going to be the characteristic polynomial. And we factor it, it's, it this time it's lambda minus four, lambda minus seven. And eigenvalues of A are, um, four and seven. So this matrix has two eigenvalues, four and seven, and we are going to find eigenvectors for them. For them. So our hope is that we can find two linearly independent ones. Now, spoiler, we will always be able to do that if you have two, if, if it's two by two matrix and you have two different um, eigenvalues, because there's a theorem that says that eigenvalues of one um, um, eigenvalue are never going to be linearly dependent on the eigenvalues of another one. Uh, that's a, the, we will have a video just for that, um, just, just for that fact, but, but, but we don't know that right now. And so we're not going to use it. So we're just going to find eigenvectors um, for each one of them. So for Lambda equals four, we have to look at the null space or the kernel of a um, uh, of four I minus A because Lambda I minus A where Lambda is four becomes four I minus A. And so that's the matrix 618 minus three minus nine, those, nine, those are its columns and we have to find its null space. Uh, so again, this is, looks like two equations, two unknowns, but it's really one equation, one unknown. And the null space or the kernel is going to be all vectors of the form um, A to A. And so, the, um, so we can find at least one, we can find exactly one linearly independent eigenvector from those. Eigenvectors are basically the null space, except for the zero vector is in the null space, but it's not an eigenvector. And so uh, one, two, is an eigenvector for lambda equals four. And that's the only one we could, a linearly independent one that we could get for lambda equals four. But now we have to go to lambda equals seven. So here we look at seven I two minus A and find its null space. 
And again, um, we have to solve a system of linear equations, homogeneous equations, and we find that vectors of the form B, 3B are in that null space. And so all of them except the zero vector are eigenvectors for lambda equals um, seven. And so one, three is an eigenvector for lambda equals seven. So now we've got a basis ourselves. We've got two linearly independent eigenvectors and we are in R2. That's all we need. Uh, we have a basis for eigenvectors for A. And this means that A is diagonalizable because I found a basis cons for R2 consisting of uh, eigenvectors um, um, of A. This is a basis for R2 made up of eigenvectors of A. But we also know that if you can make the matrix P out of these uh, um, eigenvectors, so one, the, this matrix P's first column is the first eigenvector, the second one is the second one, um, then P inverse AP will be a diagonal, um, diagonal matrix, and um, it's, co and, and it's, and it's, Diagonal uh, elements will be the, uh, the eigenvalues. So P inverse AP will be uh, 4, 0, 0, 7. And, and in which order? Is it 4, 7 or 7, 4? The order of these eigenvalues will be exactly the order that I wrote the, uh, the eigenvectors in the basis. So uh, 4 was the eigenvalue for 1, 2, the first basis element. 7 was the eigenvalue for 1, 3, the second basis element. And so it's going to be 4, 7. If you switch them, then you would get 7, 4. Um, so, in the preview of uh, future lectures, we'll have more discussion of di diagonalizability and more examples after we talk about eigenspaces and, and talk about them a little bit. So, the, the video on eigenspaces. There will be also a video that where we show that eigenvectors uh, really help, like to be in bases. We like them to be make bases out of eigenvectors, but eigenvectors themselves like to be in bases, so they help out. And the way they help out is that eigenvectors of one uh, uh, linear, uh, one um, eigenvalue are not are automatically going to be linearly independent from eigenvectors of another uh, eigenvalue. So there will be two different videos on those. And uh, we will also have, uh, we also have some videos on applications, although this course is not really about applications, but uh, we will have at least two uh, applications videos, one on differential equations and one on solving recurrence relations um, that, uh, that shows the applications of diagonalizability. This is the end of this lecture and I will see you in the next one.